Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, proud citizens of vast early America, and the primary partners in the Georgian Papers program. The Georgian Papers program aims to digitize, interpret, and make available an extraordinarily rich collection of correspondence, maps, and royal household ledgers created by the Georgian kings of England and their families. This program is huge because it seeks to make available its approximately 350,000 items to the world. Digital access to this collection promises to really change our understanding of the Georgian period and of 18th and early 19th century North America. Now, as part of its contribution to this program, the Omohundro Institute is sending scholars to Windsor Castle, where they get to work alongside real archivists as they seek to gain greater insight into these rich materials. Rick Atkinson, the author of the Liberation Trilogy and a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, is one of the scholars the Omohundro Institute helps send to Windsor Castle. Now, Rick remarked that he's worked in some exotic locations, Mogadishu, Mali, Baghdad, Kazakhstan. But none of these places has been more evocative than the Royal Archives based in the Round Tower at Windsor Castle. He also noted that working within the Georgian papers gave him a new understanding of King George III. He said that the information contained in these papers makes the American stereotype of George as a tyrannical nincompoop quickly dissolve. Because it's within these papers that we get to see that George had all the worries and preoccupations of a devoted husband and father, and of a monarch who had to wrestle with the fretful issue of how to prepare his son, a prince, to become a king in a changing world. With the help of the Omohundro Institute, the royal archivists are digitizing the Georgian papers, so soon you'll be able to delve into the world of Georgian Britain for yourself and read all about King George as a husband, father, and monarch. For more information about the Georgian papers and the Omohundro Institute's support of it, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Georgian Papers. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 142 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Many scholars and people with an interest in history think that the history of the American abolitionist movement begins just before the Civil War during the antebellum period. But it didn't. The movement to end chattel slavery in America actually began long before the United States was even a nation. Manisha Sinha, the Draper Chair of American History at the University of Connecticut, has written a new award-winning book on the subject of American abolitionism. It's called The Slave's Cause, A History of Abolition. And in her book, Manisha has a whole lot to say about the early American origins of the abolition movement. So today, she's going to lead us through these early American origins, and in doing so, reveal the origins of the American abolition movement, how the Age of Revolutions contributed to the early abolition movement and gave it momentum, and how events like the Haitian Revolution and the Constitutional Convention of 1787 impacted the abolition movement. But first, are you ready to meet in Philadelphia next week? I'm excited about it. Be sure you send me an email or join the conversation in the Ben Franklin's World Listener community on Facebook so that you get the most up-to-date information regarding our meetup. It looks like we're going to meet up on July 22nd at the Black Sheep Pub on South 17th Street at 430. But let me know. Tell me you're coming by sending an email to liz at benfranklinsworld.com or by joining the listener community by texting BFWorld233444. Okay, are you ready to explore the early origins of the American abolitionist movement? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is the Draper Chair Professor in American History at the University of Connecticut. She's interested in transnational histories of slavery and abolition, and she's the author of two books, The Counter-Revolution of Slavery, Politics and Ideology in Antebellum, South Carolina, and The Slave's Cause, A History of Abolition, winner of the 2017 Avery O. Craven Prize for the best book in the Civil War era. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Manisha Sinha. Thank you, Liz. Manisha, we're so glad you could join us because the history of abolitionism is quite fascinating, and according to your book... It's a movement with deep roots in early American history. Exactly. People don't generally associate the abolition movement with the 18th century, but I found its roots right back there. 
Now, in The Slave's Cause, you write about the history of the abolition movement as being more than just an antebellum or pre-Civil War phenomenon. So would you provide us with an overview of what the abolition movement entailed and when it took place? Right. So I'm a 19th century historian. And when I started writing this book, I thought I would just write a 19th century story. But the more I wrote, the more I realized that this is not just an antebellum pre-Civil War story, that you had to go back to the roots of abolition in the 18th century and at the turn of the century, you know, the era of the early republic. And what I found was that abolition as a movement really began during the revolutionary age. You had abolition societies. And many times these societies had been dismissed by historians as being gradualist and relatively conservative. But I thought that, you know, they were actually somewhat ahead of their times and, you know, deserve the name of abolitionists. So the abolitionist movement was really composed of people who were activists. They were people who formed societies and who agitated for an end to slavery. And what was intriguing about many of these abolitionists was that not only did they want an end to slavery, but unlike many of their peers who may have been anti-slavery, they also championed black citizenship in the American Republic. So that kind of became my marker for whom to call an abolitionist and which society to call an abolitionist society. These were men and at times women and blacks who, this is for the early period, who really believed in some form of racial equality. So to look at that, I looked at many of these, you know, early abolitionist societies during the revolutionary era that were fighting for an end to slavery in their respective states, and that also were championing ideas of Black citizenship and equality. One of the curious things about your book, and in looking at the history of abolitionism is such a long movement, is that you labeled the sections of your book, First Wave and Second Wave Abolition. And I couldn't help but read these section titles and think about the history of feminism. So did you select and use these terms as an homage to feminism? You know, perhaps it was. What I wanted to do was employ a kind of a social movement perspective on the abolition movement. You know, many times abolitionists are just viewed as these cranks, fanatics, or religious enthusiasts. And in fact, if you look at the history of abolition and study its archives, you realize it was a radical social movement, just like feminism. And I like the first wave, second wave sort of periodization because this first wave of abolition in the 18th century in the revolutionary age has been overlooked. And also historians have overlooked some of the continuities in terms of issues and ideas between the first wave of abolition in the revolutionary era and the second wave in the 19th century. So unlike previous historians of abolition, I don't see a break in the history between these two periods. And I thought the wave metaphor kind of captured that. And because I look at women in the abolition movement and the emergence of the first women's rights movement from within the abolition movement, I thought that was an apt metaphor. Let's dig into the first wave of abolitionism. In The Slave's Cause, Manisha notes that the history of abolitionism must begin with the struggles of the enslaved. Manisha, would you tell us about these struggles and how, where, and when abolitionism started? Yes. So when I started digging into the roots and the origins of the abolition movement, what I found was that besides some lone Quaker abolitionists, some lone Protestant dissenters who spoke out against slavery, also some early Catholic writers, actually, Jesuits and Dominicans, you could really see that instances of Black rebellion and resistance to slavery sort of went hand in hand, was kind of in tandem with these early protests. And many times these early protests on slavery sort of cited instances of slave rebellion and resistance as the source of their inspiration. So I thought it was important to look at some of the early instances of slave rebellion and running away, which slaves did right from the colonial era onwards in tandem with the sort of early Quaker protests and early Protestant protests against slavery in British North America. So, you know, it sort of begins with these what seem like isolated voices, but especially within Quakerism, it quickly coalesces into a kind of a movement where first the society itself starts divesting from the slave trade and slavery, but quickly becomes the sort of impetus to the rise of early abolition and manumission societies. 
like the Pennsylvania Abolition Society or the New York Manumission Society, which are the two most prominent ones. So, yes, I think that it is important to look at the role that people of African descent themselves played in inspiring these early abolitionist protests. It sounds like abolitionism got its start in both religion and with those who resisted slavery. Now, you noted the role early Quaker and Catholic writers played in founding the movement. What about early African writers? Absolutely. So, you know, first you had these kind of religious protests against slavery in the New World. Just, you know, a lot of it was looking at the extreme cruelty involved in enslaving others. So right from Las Casas down to Anthony Benazay and John Woolman, Benjamin Lay, some of these outstanding Quaker abolitionists, you could see how these men are sort of protesting against slavery based on some of their religious convictions. So for many Quakers, it was a violation of their peace testimony. You know, their protests against war and slavery went hand in hand. And what was interesting for me to see is that besides sort of acting on the ground, as it were, you know, running away from slavery or being part of slave conspiracies and slave rebellions, people of African descent are very early on sort of writing against slavery. And a lot of them have been taught or have sort of joined churches, have been taught by clergymen, by ministers, become devout Christians themselves. And what was interesting for me to see was that many of them, including the young poet Phyllis Wheatley, used Christianity to critique racism. And that was something that you find that was kind of ubiquitous in all early Black writing. Even those who said, well, you know, maybe contact with Europeans was good in order for Africans to convert from heathenism to Christianity, even when they adopted that kind of missionary rhetoric, a lot of them quickly talked about how Africans were better Christians than Europeans because they actually believed in the brotherhood of man. And a lot of them use Christian ideas to critique sort of early ideas about inherent racial inferiority or early ideas, you know, seeing Africans as not being part of the human family or having a different genesis. That was seen as anti-Christian because it went against the story of creation in the Bible, but it served African writers well to use those Christian stories of the creation of man, monogenesis, to argue for racial equality and against sort of the new science of man, which was kind of a predecessor to what we would call scientific racism in the 19th century. So yes, Christianity plays an important role in early African protests against racial slavery. Do we know just how widely read the works of Phyllis Wheatley and other early African writers were? That's a good question. Phyllis Wheatley is actually quite remarkable because she is published in London. You know, she gains the patronage of prominent British nobility. Her poems are widely read in the Atlantic world. You know, she receives, you know, sort of fan letters from prominent people. When she's in London, she meets Benjamin Franklin. She meets Granville Sharp. She meets important abolitionist figures, important revolutionary figures. And her poetry inspires British and American women to write against slavery, who refer to her, the Afric Muse, the Black Phyllis, etc. So, you know, I haven't actually done a count in terms of you know, how many people actually read her poems, but she is widely read. Her letters are printed in newspapers in New England. Her poetry, you know, is well known and is known long after her death in 1784. She is constantly referred to by abolitionists, and her poems are reprinted well into the mid-19th century. Now, in addition to these early African writers and Quaker activists, Manisha notes in The Slave's Cause that the age of revolutions is really what helped give rise to the first wave of abolitionism. Manisha, would you tell us what the age of revolutions was and why and how ideas of that age intersected and even clashed with ideas about slavery? So, you know, we all know that Enlightenment ideas, revolutionary ideas about liberty, equality, and fraternity had at least aspired to make certain universal claims about freedom. And clearly, for people of African descent, these ideas were inspiring. But at the same time, it was quite clear that they were not included, either intentionally or just by oversight, in these ideas. 
And to me, what was interesting was not simply the way it is commonly seen, you know, to see these early Black writers as simply adopting these ideas unchanged, you know, that there's some sort of contagion of liberty that spreads by itself, or that they simply appropriated these ideas and said, include us too. What I saw was a fairly critical look at revolutionary ideology. So in a way, they engage with those ideas and add to them. And it is not just black abolitionists, but also white abolitionists. You know, abolitionists as a whole, if we see it as an interracial movement, they're not simply saying, oh, include black people too, or, or can you not see the paradox or the irony of fighting for liberty and yet holding others in slavery? They went much beyond that. They critiqued ideas of, quote, white liberty, of political slavery, and said, you know, that we should really be paying attention to the most enormous evil in society, and that is chattel slavery. And for me, that was what was interesting. You can see that repeated in some of these abolitionist writings by prominent abolitionists of the day, including Benazé, other Quaker abolitionists like David Cooper, Samuel Hopkins, a Congregationalist minister who ministers to African Americans in Rhode Island, and among Black freedom petitioners and Blacks who are suing for their freedom. And you can see that kind of critical edge in their voice where they don't only want to adopt revolutionary ideas, but they want to expand its boundaries and sort of reimagine it. That was what was interesting for me. Did the founders also see this paradox of supporting chattel slavery while at the same time fighting for liberty and freedom from what they happen to call British tyranny? Absolutely, they did. You know, even the Southern founders like Jefferson, etc., could not help but notice that paradox, that contradiction, and it was brought to their attention. Now, of course, historians beginning with Edmund Morgan have argued that, in a way, especially the Virginians, could articulate a radical idea of white liberty precisely because they relied on black chattel slavery. What I found was that either the idea that all the founding fathers were devoutly anti-slavery, you know, that's a bit of a myth, or the other sort of extreme, which is that they were all racist and none of them were concerned about slavery, I think is also an overstatement. The truth lies somewhere in the middle. They were all aware of the contradictions, but what I did notice was a sectional divide. Many of the Northern founders, like John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, not only divested themselves of their own slaves, but lent the prestige of their names to their state abolition societies. I mean, Franklin dies as the president of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. The Southern founders were far more reluctant to do that, whether it was political reasons or whether they realized that their own livelihood sort of depended on slavery. Most of them refused to sign abolitionist petitions or join abolitionist societies even though leading Quakers like Robert Pleasance, Warner Mifflin, etc., try to recruit them into the abolition movement. And out of the Southern founders, only one, Luther Martin, and he's a bit of an exception, joins the Maryland Abolition Society. Most of them don't. Many of them remain cool to abolitionism. And most of them don't free their own slaves. The one big exception, of course, is George Washington, who did free his slaves on his death. Whatever, you know, limitations that act had, I could see that black abolitionists in particular appreciated that. When Washington died, I found these eulogies on Washington by black abolitionists, which were actually quite amazing. So they appreciated whatever actions the founders took against slavery. But as a whole, most of the Southern founders spoke against slavery in the abstract, but tended not to do much about it. And some of them, like Jefferson, espouse so many sort of racial ideas that it kind of undercut their anti-slavery sentiments. Now, one of the central points of Manisha's book, indeed, one of its major contributions to the history of abolitionism, is how the slaves' cause uncovers the act of participation of African-Americans in the movement. Because historians often portray abolitionism as a movement led by white middle-class men and women. Manisha, Would you tell us about the freedom petitions filed by African-Americans during and just after the American Revolution and how these petitions laid the foundation for black abolitionism? Yes. You know, most historians acknowledge black participation in the abolition movement in the 19th century, but they do so sporadically and sometimes 
just fixated on certain individuals. For the 18th century, because many of these abolition and manumission societies were all white, even though they didn't contain any clause in their constitutions restricting black membership, in fact, blacks did not join these societies until much later. We know that the only restrictions they tended to have was against slaveholders joining their societies. So most historians assume that at least for the revolution era, the 18th century, blacks were not involved in the abolition movement. And I found that that was inaccurate. In fact, African-Americans cooperated with and were very close to the leading abolitionists and abolition societies of that time. Early black leaders, many of them literally a step away from slavery. Many of them had been enslaved themselves and then emerged as leaders of prominent black churches worked very much in concert with the early abolitionists. What also interested me was to see Black initiative in this early abolition movement. For instance, you mentioned the freedom petitioners. You know, we know that African Americans in New England in particular petitioned for their freedom. We also know that many of them petitioned for their freedom in the South, in Virginia, before Virginia passes its act liberalizing manumission, not only Quakers, but there are some African Americans petitioning the Virginia Assembly for their freedom. The most remarkable case, of course, was that of Massachusetts, where two African American slaves suing for their freedom led the Supreme Judicial Court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to pronounce that slavery was indeed abolished in Massachusetts in 1783. And it always amazed my students in Massachusetts when I told them that slavery was abolished in the state because, you know, two ordinary people had sued for their freedom. So I think it is important to look at these early instances of Black initiative in pushing the process of emancipation in the North. Again, this has generally been seen as sort of a conservative, gradualist, state-led movement, but much of the initiative is coming from African Americans and early abolitionists. Did you happen to see any specific differences between early-stage Black abolitionism and early-stage white abolitionism in your research? Well, you know, of course, for most African Americans, they spoke from first-hand experience in dealing with slavery and, of course, with racism and second-class citizenship later on. So you could say that clearly there is that difference between black abolitionists and white abolitionists. What I tended to see, though, in my reading of the abolition movement from the start and to the end was a lot more interchange, a lot more overlapping than strict racial boundaries. I think we have been ill-served by historians who tended to emphasize racial divides and racism within the abolition movement, mainly because that tended to discount the role of African Americans in influencing ideas, strategies, and tactics within the abolition movement. You know, of course, there are instances of racial paternalism, and it is interesting to see African American abolitionists immediately calling that out. But I tended to see a lot more cooperation and a lot more exchange of ideas than sort of rigid racial boundaries within the abolition movement. What the abolition movement struggles to do from this point onwards is to confront the sort of rigid racial boundaries constructed in broader society, in law, in politics, in social mores. And that's why it is seen as this radical and despised movement because of the presence of African Americans and because of the way in which it challenges not only the existence of slavery, but also the existence of racism. Now, at the same time that Black abolitionism gets its start, just after the American Revolution, the Haitian Revolution erupts in the French colony of Saint-Domingue in 1791. That revolution was the largest and most successful slave rebellion in the Western Hemisphere. And it not only led to the abolition of slavery in Saint-Domingue or Haiti, it also led to the creation of the first Black national government. Manisha, Would you tell us whether the Haitian Revolution had any impact on the American abolition movement? And if it did, how did it impact the movement and its participants? That's a great question. When we look at the Haitian Revolution, much of the reaction to it centers on pro-slavery and racist reactions to the Haitian Revolution and the effort by slaveholders to form kind of a cordon sanitaire around this one instance of a successful slave rebellion in world history, actually. 
And, you know, what I was more interested in was looking at the abolitionist reaction to the Haitian Revolution. And what I found was that abolitionists, including white abolitionists, did not shy from praising the Haitian Revolution. And I found it was not just the French abolitionists who supported early on the call for granting citizenship to gentlemen of color, free blacks in Haiti, but also in the end fighting against the slave trade and supporting the Haitian rebels. But also other abolitionists, you know, British abolitionists like William Wilberforce and Thomas Clarkson, who wrote one of the first defenses of slave rebellion in St. Domain. And in the United States, I found correspondence between the Pennsylvania Abolition Society and radical French abolitionists and Republicans in Haiti who supported the Haitian Revolution. Many, you know, American abolitionists look at the Haitian Revolution and despite the bloodbath and despite, you know, Haiti's subsequent poverty and political instability, American abolitionists are always training an admiring lens on Haiti. And this was interesting for me to see. It was true not just to black abolitionists who are very early on, you know, praising the Haitian Revolution and evoking it as an example, but also amongst white abolitionists who are supposed to be pacifists like Garrison. You know, he begins his first issues of The Liberator in writing articles in defense of the Haitian Revolution, something that you would not expect to see. I also found that Black Haitian immigrants to the United States joined the abolition movement, and some of them became agents of Garrison's Liberator. So the connection with Haiti is ongoing, and it continues throughout the antebellum period when many Black and white abolitionists become champions of immigration to Haiti, even though they are against colonizing free Blacks back to Africa or deporting them back to Africa, as some white statesmen suggest. Wow. The Haitian Revolution really highlights just how much the abolition movement in general wasn't just an American movement, but an international movement. And it sounds like the international movements had large impacts on the American movement. Absolutely. You know, what interested me was the cosmopolitanism of the American abolitionists. They're evoking Haiti. They're evoking the Latin American wars of independence that are taking place in the you know aftermath of the Age of Revolution. They evoke later on in the 19th century, the European revolutions for Republican governments, Republican self-government. They really seem to be interested in harnessing international progressive forces against slavery. And they see slavery in the United States as a remnant of the old world, as a remnant of tyranny, of monarchy, of the Ancien Regime, something that the American Republic needs to get rid of. And you see this not just amongst white abolitionists, but also black abolitionists who are constantly evoking revolutions and notions, progressive notions of self-government and democracy in order to critique slavery. The long period of emancipation in northern states began after the American Revolution. Manisha, would you tell us about this long period of northern emancipation and how it was driven not by a waning economic need for slaves, but by the black desire for freedom? Yes. So the traditional narrative of gradual emancipation in the northern states after the American Revolution is that since the north was not heavily invested in slavery the way the southern plantation states were, it was relatively easy for them to simply get rid of slavery. And I found that not to be true. If you look at the process of what I call the long northern emancipation after the American Revolution and during it, What you see is a lot of resistance by northern slaveholders to emancipation. Indeed, the reason why emancipation in the northern states is so long and torturous and gradual is because of the effective resistance put up by northern slaveholders. So even though slavery was not the defining feature, perhaps, of northern economies, though it was very prominent in cities like New York, which had the largest number of slaves after Charleston, South Carolina, that is the largest number of urban slaves, or in certain areas of the North, like the Narragansett Valley in New England, or in the Hudson River Valley in upstate New York. You had farms that relied on slave labor to a large extent in those areas. But, you know, the Northern states still were not plantation societies. So clearly, slavery was not central to them. But At the same time, northern slaveholders were opposed to emancipation, and many of them actually tried to evade northern emancipation by trying to illegally sell their slaves off down south. So there was a lot of resistance 
to emancipation. So that maybe the economic investment in the North in slavery was not as much as it was in the South, but it was enough to set up a lot of roadblocks to emancipation. It would take African Americans and abolition societies, you know, this is what consumed their energies really in the early American Republic. They first pushed for emancipation laws. Then they try to make sure that they are implemented. Then they try to make sure that subsequent laws are passed to prevent illegal activity like kidnapping of Northern Blacks into slavery or the selling off of manumitted slaves into slavery. So Jonah Truth, for instance, in New York, she was a slave in New York, spent you know, a lot of time seeking assistance from anti-slavery lawyers to get her son back from Alabama. He was illegally sold into slavery after New York had abolished slavery. So this was her own personal sort of education into the abolition movement. And you can see this happening throughout the North. And that's why I argue in my book that if you really study the process of emancipation in the North, you have to look at Black initiative and you have to look at the ways in which abolitionists and Blacks had to ensure that these laws were implemented. I wonder if you would tell us just exactly how the North enacted and carried out its emancipation during its long period of emancipation. And I also wonder, you know, since we've been talking about abolitionism, if there's a difference between emancipation and abolition. Yes. So, you know, the abolition that the abolitionists advocated for was an end to slavery. Emancipation was a state regulated process. In most cases, it was, you know, the state legislature that passed these emancipation laws. And most of them are modeled after Pennsylvania's gradual emancipation law of 1780, which made sure that, you know, that they would respect slaveholders' property rights because slaveholders were so prominent in many of these legislative assemblies. So what you had was a process of gradual emancipation that freed children of slaves, but not the slaves themselves, and had these children many times work for their freedom, literally be apprenticed to their masters till they reached adulthood. And each state had differing ages for men and women from when exactly they would be freed. But Pennsylvania's law was the model. Now, some states were more immediatist and were kind of more abolitionist, you could say. I've already told you a bit about Massachusetts, which was a little exceptional, but also Vermont, for instance, which abolished slavery in 1777 in its state constitution. Vermont was known for its radicalism when it was formed as a state. In fact, it was the only state that established universal manhood suffrage, but it also abolished slavery. But even in Vermont, we find cases of African-Americans who were a very minuscule part of that population, around 2% of the state's population, suing for their freedom and making sure that the abolitionist provisions of the Vermont Constitution are upheld. So there are actually cases in Vermont state courts with Blacks suing for their freedom or fighting against masters who are trying to illegally sell them off. So, yes, the process of emancipation in the North is interesting. It varies between these sort of more immediatist cases in New England versus the more sort of gradual emancipation laws that are passed in states like Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey. New Jersey is the last state to pass a gradual emancipation law in 1804, and its process of emancipation is really long drawn out so that even on the eve of the Civil War, you had lifetime indentured servants who were formerly slaves in New Jersey. So it is a long process, and it works out unevenly in these different northern states. From the slaves' cause, we get the idea that the Constitutional Convention of 1787 and the compromises made during that convention actually contributed to the long, drawn-out process of emancipation and abolition in the North. Manisha, would you tell us about the compromises that were made during the Constitutional Convention and why those compromises delayed abolition in places like New York and New Jersey? So in the Constitutional Convention, you know, abolitionists, especially Hopkins, who wrote this sort of open letter to the delegates of the Constitutional Convention, were really hopeful that at this moment of state formation of the founding of the Republic, that the convention itself would take some step towards ending slavery and at least would immediately end the African slave trade that had been suspended during the revolutionary era. 
Instead, you have all these compromises in the Constitutional Convention because Northern founders realized, even those that were anti-slavery in sentiment, realized that they needed to have a union with Southern slaveholders. And, you know, the classic compromises in the Constitution, which does not mention the word slavery, but gives it some kind of ironclad protections with the Fugitive Slave Clause that allows Southern laws of slavery to be respected throughout the Union. You have the delay of the ban on the African slave trade. The clause in the African slave trade basically says that it cannot be abolished until 1808. This leads some southern states like South Carolina to literally reopen the African slave trade. So for abolitionists, these are all setbacks. And then, of course, there is the three-fifths clause that gives slaveholders extra representation in the House of Representatives for holding slaves. You know, many times this clause is seen as saying that African Americans were seen as three-fifths of a human being. That is incorrect. It does not say that. It simply counts the slaves at a three-fifths level for representation in the House of Representatives. In fact, Southerners wanted them counted fully so that they would gain even more representation in the federal government. Now, these were all setbacks for abolitionists who felt that this moment would not come again, meaning that you are writing the fundamental law of the country at this time. And many abolitionists felt that if the founding fathers were true to their republican principles, they would at least ensure that there would be some sort of provision, not just for the immediate end, but even for a gradual end of slavery. So they saw the Constitutional Convention as a setback. And now, of course, the debate over the Constitution had far more to do with the principles of federalism. There were some sort of anti-federalists in the South who felt that too strong a federal government had been created that could eventually act against slavery. On the other hand, you had anti-federalists in the North who felt that not enough action had been taken against slavery. But the point remains that for abolitionists, this was seen as a setback. And because the Constitutional Convention itself did not take a strong stance against slavery, you had this delay in the unfolding of abolition, even in the North. In New York, of course, we know that, you know, the delay was mainly because the initial abolition law proposed in New York not only ended slavery, but had, you know, sort of excluded African Americans from voting and from government. And so it was really abolitionists who opposed that. So it is not until 1799 that you have an abolition law being passed. In New Jersey, you had a sort of east-west divide in New Jersey, where slaveholders very successfully in New Jersey managed to postpone abolition, and not only postpone abolition, but when the law is eventually passed, they try to whittle it down, and they try to make sure that their interests are protected for a very long time. And this sort of explains New Jersey's very conservative politics on slavery and race right down to the Civil War. You know, it is the only northern state that does not give all its electoral votes to Abraham Lincoln on the eve of the war. This is really fascinating because, you know, I don't know about you, but in my New England school education, we learned that all the compromises on slavery that came with the Constitution were pushed for by Southerners. But you're saying that you found that it was really Northerners who pushed for these compromises. Well, you could say that North acquiesced in a lot of these compromises over slavery. And you can see Northerners of anti-slavery sentiment putting nationalism and creating the American Republic above anti-slavery. You could say that. You know, they realized that if they were going to form this nation, so even people who are arguing for the new constitution, people like Hamilton, like Jay, who are very much associated with the New York Manumission Society, with abolition societies, they are willing to sort of put their anti-slavery sentiments in the back burner in order to create this new nation. What is tragic is that once you had those ironclad protections or recognitions for slavery in the Constitution, it would take a bloody civil war to get rid of it, and it would take the remaking of the U.S. Constitution through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments after the Civil War to entirely get rid of the vestiges of slavery. Now, something we may be wondering is if northern states abolished and eliminated slavery largely because of the black desire for freedom. Why weren't abolitionists able to mobilize and organize to push for the same outcome in southern states? Yes, of course, you know, emancipation is a complicated process that involved many actors. 
So it is not only black desire for freedom, but clearly black desire for freedom is the underlying sort of impetus for emancipation. You know, they have allies, both political and abolitionists, that helps make this a reality in the North. In the South, the black desire for freedom is literally squelched. And you can see this. So I gave you the example of Virginia, where, you know, blacks are petitioning there too. Now, what happens in Virginia is they liberalize manumission. But instead of of moving forward to abolition, they regress in sort of curtailing manumission by 1806 by requiring all blacks who have been freed to leave the state, which would mean, you know, they would have to leave their homes and their families at times. But also what happens is that because in the South, the political establishment never supports abolition. In the North, you could say that there are some prominent politicians governors of states, prominent legislators who adopt abolition or at least emancipation as something that the state ought to move on. In the South, that never happens. And what they do is they discriminate against abolition and manumission societies, both legally and extra-legally, till it goes sort of underground. So in Virginia, for instance, if a person sued for their freedom, in the jury, you could have slaveholders, but members of abolition societies were prohibited because they were seen as special pleading. So it's ironic that slaveholders could be part of a jury that would judge, you know, whether a person is eligible to sue for freedom or not, but not members of abolition societies. There's also, by the early 19th century, you know, a lot of reaction against abolitionists and sort of prescription against abolition, both formal and informal. So the abolitionists that are left in these states are many times Blacks. In fact, I would argue the reason why many border state slaveholders, especially in the upper south like Maryland, Delaware, and Virginia, are interested in colonization, you know, getting rid of free blacks back to Africa, is because they see free blacks as an abolitionist element in their own societies. They see the petitions coming from them. They see churches and schools being formed by free blacks. And even those whites who sympathize with them are prescribed. So you can see abolition societies led by Southern Quakers, etc., being stamped out. You can see this happening in North Carolina. You have a migration. In fact, one historian has called these people migrants against slavery. You have many abolitionists, many free blacks, sometimes slaves moving out of these states at this time. The Quakers, you know, they try their best, and many of them stick it on, sometimes right up to the 1840s. But many Southern Quakers, entire families move out of the Upper South because their societies are sort of discriminated against, and they are discriminated against, and then they have to face state laws that criminalizes freeing of people. So yes, you know, you can see that state repression rather than political help really ends the momentum for emancipation in the South. So yes, Black desire for freedom is important, but they needed to win over some important politicians, you know, needed to have some access to the state and political power in order to implement emancipation. And this gives us a sense of why government is so important, why democracy is so important, why civil liberties is so important for abolitionists. They always link the cause of the slave to these broader questions about democratic principles because they realize that in order to implement emancipation, one has to have access to state political power and something that abolitionists learned, of course, during the Civil War. Our discussion thus far has really centered on the first wave of abolitionism or the early history of the movement, which doesn't even represent half of the history that Manisha writes about in The Slave's Cause. So Manisha, would you give us a brief overview of the second wave of abolitionism and how this first wave paved the way for the second wave? Yes, so it was important for me to trace the second wave of abolition as being even far more interracial and radical than the first wave was. And of course, it includes women, women not just in formally organized anti-slavery societies, but also in positions of power within the abolition movement. That creates a rupture within the abolition movement. But the point remains that the second wave of abolition really builds on this foundation that is laid by the first wave of abolition. And what I saw was that it becomes more and more radicalized. You know, you have this phase of the development of the Underground Railroad, where people are challenging Southern laws of slavery, even the federal fugitive slave laws, in far more activist and confrontational ways even before the crisis decade of the 1850s, 
But you can also see them employing the law and employing uh, northern emancipation laws against slavery, trying to establish the freedom principle for the republic as a whole, trying to confine southern slavery, prevent its spread, trying to make sure that it is eventually gotten rid of. So the reaction to, you know, the politics of slavery becomes, of course, far more severe, beginning with the Missouri crisis and ending over the fight in Kansas in the 1850s. You can see that northern abolitionists and anti-slavery politicians are really coming to grips with what they call the slave power, you know, the power of slaveholders within the federal government that has been laid to a certain extent by the three-fifths clause of the United States Constitution and the Fugitive Slave Law, but also reckoning with slavery in very diverse ways, whether it came to the rescue of fugitive slaves by abolitionist crowds in courts or whether it was using writs of habeas corpus to try to implement northern laws of freedom in the North itself, preventing slaveholders from sojourning with their slaves in the North or from even residing in the North and therefore flouting local emancipation laws. You can see this sort of gathering momentum that leads to the creation of the anti-slavery Republican Party and that leads to the rise of Lincoln. So yes, it was important for me to tell that story. And in a way, it builds on, but it also expands the horizons of abolition. And abolition really comes into its own before the Civil War. And we normally do not look at the abolitionists as emancipators, but they were. And it is difficult for me to think of emancipation during the Civil War without this long prehistory of abolitionist agitation. I wonder if we could take a look behind the scenes of the slaves' cause, because your book is a really comprehensive study of abolitionism. So I wonder if you would take us through what it was like to research and write your book. I mean, you must have visited a ton of archives and faced a number of research challenges along the way. Yes, this is 10 years of my blood, sweat and tears, as I always put it. I researched and wrote this book over 10 years. I did not plan to write a big book. The book began as a history of African Americans within the abolition movement, which I then realized I could not tell in isolation. It grew into a broader history of abolition. And then I realized that many of these abolitionists, my sources actually expanded my book. Many of the 19th century abolitionists are referring to this earlier wave of abolition. And I found myself going right back to the 18th century. I was lucky that as I wrote this book, many of the sources that I was looking at got digitized. And that was a tremendous help to me. So, of course, I, you know, visited the archives. I went to the New York Public Library, the Library of Congress, the New York Historical Society, to the Library Company in Pennsylvania, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And I was lucky to be living in Massachusetts, you know, the anti-slavery collection at Boston Public Library. This research project began in the American Antiquarian Society, which has an amazing collection of abolitionist newspapers and pamphlets. I was just lucky also that the black abolitionist papers had been microfilmed. I read them in print, in microfilm, and when they got digitized, I read them digitally too. So I was lucky about that. The most important in terms of digitization was these huge collections like the Slavery Anti-Slavery Collection by Gage that basically digitized anything to do with slavery and anti-slavery, not just in the United States, but also in Britain. So that was of tremendous help to me that I was able to utilize that. You know, I had it on my fingertips on my command in my computer. I really appreciated all the work that people at Accessible Archives, etc., have done in digitizing our sources that has made research so much easier. I also read the large amount of secondary literature on abolition. You know, many times historians write and they sometimes are reinventing the wheel because there's an amazing amount of secondary literature on abolitionists. And it was important for me, even when I disagreed with them, to read that. And it was an education in itself to simply cover the vast abolitionist historiography. And I think that is what gave me a sense of writing the big book, not just as a compilation of kind of facts and figures, but really to have the analytical framework in my brain. It was important to do that work, to do all that reading, because I think we miss out when we do sort of selective research or selective reading in the secondary sources. We miss out on this broader picture of abolition. And I think I was able then to kind of overturn some of the many 
conventional wisdom on abolition, which is sort of repeated endlessly in textbooks and by other historians writing about other materials, simply because, you know, people, instead of going back to the archives, tend to simply repeat what is the received wisdom on the topic. And I really wanted to interrogate that. And that's why I ended up writing the big book on abolition. Let's jump to the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if African Americans had not had the ability to participate in the abolition movement? How would the absence of African American participation in abolitionism have altered the movement? That's a great counterfactual (laughs) question. And, you know, I think the movement would have been a lot more conservative if it would have even existed, if African Americans were not part of it. You know, what made the abolition movement a radical social movement was its interracialism was the fact that black and white abolitionists could meet in a space that was simply not possible in early America otherwise. And I think the abolition movement would definitely not have emerged as this sort of radical interracial space. Maybe the abolition movement would not have emerged at all. I would argue that perhaps the favored anti-slavery movement would have been colonization. After all, that was predominantly an all-white movement The American Colonization Society grew out of the religious reforms, the Second Great Awakening, the moral reforms of the day. It was a lot like the American Tract Society, the American Bible Society. And its plan was not racial equality. It was not to imagine an interracial democracy in the United States, but was to actually deport all free African Americans, albeit voluntarily, back to Africa to create a lily-white American republic. So maybe that would have been the predominant form of anti-slavery without the participation of African Americans, a weak anti-slavery colonization movement that would never have fought for black citizenship, but would have implemented the program of colonization, which is something that Jefferson first spoke about, that prominent whites like Henry Clay, James Madison, James Monroe, after whom the capital of Liberia, the colony of the American Colonization Society in West Africa was named. That would have been the dominant way of ending slavery, which I think would have been a tragedy for the United States. It was something that Abraham Lincoln, of course, grew out of. He was a colonizationist and eventually came to abolitionist ground in supporting black citizenship during the Civil War. So, uh, yeah, I think that's the way it would have gone. You spent 10 years researching and writing The Slave's Cause. So what's next? What are you researching and writing about now, Manisha? I am actually writing a new book on Reconstruction right now. So that's moved me now to the end of the 19th century, to the turn of the 20th. So it seems my work is spanning (laughs) the chronology of American history. I think I will still stick to the 19th century mainly. But I'm writing a new book on Reconstruction. A lot of the new literature on Reconstruction since Eric Bona's magnum opus has tended to highlight the failures of Reconstruction. And I think I'm going to have a slightly different look at it, really look at the abolitionist origins of Reconstruction, look at what Du Bois centered in his history of Reconstruction, as its subtitle says, the role Black folk played in reconstructing American democracy, but also look at women and westward expansion and the subjugation of Native American nations in the aftermath of Reconstruction. So a new history of Reconstruction that I think will probably not be as big as this book on abolition, but will point to ways in which we can think of Reconstruction as really the political program that the abolitionists wanted to implement in this country. And why it was implemented briefly and how it was overthrown is going to be the story of the next book. Is there a place on the internet where we can go and find more information about you and your work and how we can contact you with questions? Absolutely. You can go to my profile in the Department of History at the University of Connecticut and also to my profile in the Distinguished Lecture Series of the Organization of American Historians. I've been a bit of a Luddite with this, but at some point, I hope to have a website running, which might give readers and your audience more direct access 
to a lot of my writing and my work. But that is yet to go up. But it is definitely on the agenda. Manisha Sinha, thank you for helping us explore and better understand the early stages of the abolition movement. Thank you so much for having me, Liz. Most histories of the American abolitionist movement begin their narratives just before the Civil War. But in doing so, they miss the important early American origins of the movement. As Manisha noted, the work of early American abolitionist societies does look conservative in comparison to the work of their antebellum counterparts. But within these first societies, there were bona fide abolitionists, men who advocated for the end of slavery in the United States and who championed citizenship and equality for African Americans. And it was these views and activities that made these societies quite radical in their own day. So radical, in fact, Southern states worked to stamp out these societies and pressured the men and women who supported them to move out of their states. Southern states wanted to squash all ideas that the practice of slavery would end and that the enslaved had rights to citizenship and freedom. Of course, as Manisha related, people in northern states weren't overly enthusiastic about the idea of getting rid of slavery either. Instead, they made compromises with the South at the Constitutional Convention, ensuring that the Constitution would protect slavery. And most northern states passed very gradual emancipation laws. So gradual that New Jersey didn't abolish slavery until 1846, and Connecticut held off until 1848. Plus, starting our search for understanding about the American abolition movement in the antebellum period also obscures the long and vital role African Americans played to push both the colonies and the United States to abolish slavery. As Manisha revealed, enslaved African Americans resisted slavery, filed freedom suits, and in some cases spoke out and wrote against the institution of slavery. Free African Americans also participated in abolitionism by forming their own abolition organizations and societies and by working in concert with their white counterparts to bring the institution to an end. It's by looking at the early American origins of the abolition movement that we can best see the movement as it was, as a cosmopolitan movement where whites and blacks work both separately and together to affect the end of slavery and to add blacks as citizens to the new republic. Look for more information about Manisha, her book, The Slave's Cause, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash one four two. I'd like to take a moment to thank Holly White, a historian at the College of William & Mary, who provided production assistance for this episode. Thank you for all your help, Holly. Now, during our conversation, you heard Manisha mention just how important the digitization of historical materials has been for her research. This is why the Omohundro Institute became the primary partner in the Georgian Papers program, and why they support so many other initiatives to digitize historical records. They want historians and anyone else with an interest in history to be able to access these important collections. To learn more about the Omohundro Institute and its great work to support the Georgian Papers program, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Georgian Papers. Finally, what do you think about the early American abolition movement? Do you think we can view it as a radical movement? Let me know. Send an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me, at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.